And Elena, welcome back to Talk Python to me. It's awesome to have yes. you here. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always good to have you on the show. You know, we had uh, had you on several times before. We talked about testing and mocking out dependencies in Python. And the very first time was this is quite a while ago. Yeah, it way was. way back in 2018. Uh, we talked about the magical universe, 100 Days of Python by learning uh, through Harry Potter-themed problems, which is very fun. I learned so much in that project. It was really nice. I can still recommend it to anyone to do this 100 Days of Code. Yeah, it's it's super fun and super fun. So uh, let's maybe do a quick catch-up before we dive into Python packaging comparisons and positioning. Yeah, what have you been up to? Uh, um, yeah, so I'm still a machine learning engineer. Um, I'm in a German company. I th think I was there the last time as well. It's called Innovex. Um, and we do all kinds of machine learning projects with customers. So I rotate from project to project. Right now I'm working in a, at a company called Babel. Not sure if you heard of that. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's really a fantastic company since they enable users to learn new languages. And I'm working in the speech recognition team, which I like a lot since talking is such an important part of learning a new language. And yeah, I'm there as a senior machine learning engineer and helping them build their product, develop it further. And I really love it there. Yeah, that sounds like such a fun problem to be working on. And machine learning is evolving so quickly, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, are you, especially are you now with... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, with the generative AI, um, there's so much going on, so much you can do that it's hard to <laughs> keep track of what's happening sometimes. Yeah, it seems like as soon as you have it figured out, something new comes along. Are you able to talk about uh, what libraries you're using for that project? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, Sorry. no worries. <laughs> no, I, checked before, I checked before that I'm allowed to say that I work on speech recognition, but that's basically <laughs> that, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, I'm... I'm going to guess it probably has something to do with Python, but we'll we'll leave it there. I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> awesome. So, and that's not a surprise, right? To say uh, people are doing machine nope. learning with Python. That's yeah. by far <laughs> the most popular way to yeah. do it these days. Cool. Well, again, that sounds like a super fun um, thing to be working on right, right on the cutting edge. And uh, tech, understanding spoken word is uh, especially tricky, right? Yeah. For me, it's also so nice since I use the software myself to learn a language and working on something that is useful not only for you, but so, for so many people, since mm -hmm. it can be so hard to learn a different language, that's really nice. Yeah. It's really fun to work on software. It's more fun to work on software that you know other people, many other people are using it. It's, yes. it's a special kind of joy, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say that uh, projects that you work on have to use Python dependencies and virtual environments and stuff? Yes, so much. <laughs> That's actually also why I did this talk in the beginning or why I started working on a talk on this topic since I was in a different project. And the people there asked me, okay, which packaging tool should we use? And I was like, wow, this is so difficult. I cannot even answer it since I know that there are so many tools out there. I didn't have a good overview of them yeah. and also especially not of the differences and what they are good for, what they can do, what they are not good for. And then I started digging into the topic and I was like, wow, this is such just so complex and so yeah. many different tools. And yeah, it was really time for a good overview. I And I think you did a really fantastic job writing this up and you did it in two varieties, right? You have the article on your your blog and then you also have you gave a talk at PyCon DE right so yes, depending how people at, want to experience it yeah I also gave one at EuroPython which is a more updated version I guess since okay. Rye came out after I gave the talk at the German PyCon so the mm -hmm. new um, video from EuroPython which is not on YouTube yet it also features Rye um, cool yeah, we'll talk about Which, Rye. Yeah. This is crazy since it already shows that in a few months um, there was another change and another tool came up, which is so popular now. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's only this. It's only a a few months old. Your Icon DE talk, and it's it's already a little outdated, right? That that yes. highlights what you're talking about, doesn't it? Well, let's start. Let's start by thinking about Python from a beginner's perspective, because the one of the first things that people are like, okay, Python is awesome. Whether they're a machine learning engineer who wants to use PyTorch, they're a web developer who is all excited about fast API or whatever, right? One of the huge powers of Python is that you have almost half a million libraries on pypi.org to work with, right? And so if you pick one of them, it's awesome. It says, okay, this somewhere requires, like, for example, fast API requires. Python 3.7 or above. That's a pretty low bar these days. But, you know, there's already two things you have to deal with. Fast API, the package, the version of it so it can't clash, and the version of Python that it runs on. And somehow, as a beginner, you have to figure out, okay, how do I put all these things together, right? And how do you get started yeah. with these environments? So maybe speak to that just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good um, starting point since especially when you begin, I remember that for me, the concept of a virtual environment already was really confusing, although it's such a simple thing to understand. And then to go from there, maybe how you install packages um, in the best way, since I think it's always a good idea to start with a virtual environment, since then you have your dependencies in this nice little yeah, box or environment where it's isolated from the rest and you do not have these dependency issues between different projects you might have or might work on that require the same package, but in a different version. So you can create this virtual environment or maybe the local environment. There's also this new variant and then you can install packages there. So for example, with the fast API you just showed, you could use pip to install it. Um, given that you have the right Python version. Yeah, wow, this already shows right now since um, this is already the next category, right? Python version yeah. management. Yeah, yeah, it can be quite confusing. So you need the right Python version, um, which you can handle um, using a tool or different tools are available for that. Then you need to be able to install the package with pip, for example, or another tool. And it would be nice, or it's always nice to have a virtual environment for your different projects, which you will also need a tool for. Um, yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, so I guess it's already three things just if you want to get started. With, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in your article, in your talk, you you broke it down into five different categories these, these yes. tools might work in, right? And depending on the tool chain you choose, you might need to use two or three different tools just to get started, right? Mm-hmm. Or you use one tool that can do it all. I think that for most would be the ultimate goal, I guess, that we have this single one tool. And I remember that you had this um, panel on packaging, right? Where mm -hmm. you also right. talked about the difficulties um, of creating this tool and why it is so hard to do that in Python. And yeah, so I identified five main categories. One is Python version management, which we just mentioned already. Then you have environment management, where you can create, manage your virtual environments. We have um, package management, which is basically about installing packages and yeah, upgrading them when you need yeah. a new version. And then when it comes to packaging, um, I first thought, okay, there's just packaging, but there's actually also tools that can just do the package build step. Yep. And then there are tools that just do the publishing. So I split it up into two categories, one for building and one for publishing. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, the publishing stuff, people have less exposure to, right? You, That's yeah. farther down the line. You're not really a beginner at that point anymore. Not usually, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. But I think since many of the tools that do the building step also do the publishing step, you most of the time are going to use a tool that could do it anyway. Sure, sure. I guess, yeah. Yeah, a, a bit of real-time follow-up follow from the audience here. Tushar says, actually, the EuroPython Python videos came out just yesterday. So how about oh, that? Oh, that's People so can nice. Check that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we can link it in the show notes. Yeah, we absolutely can. Cool. Thanks for, for letting us know. 
So we've already started in kind of talking about the, the categorization here. And I, I'll give a, a quick shout out to some of the, the tools. You know, obviously PIP is involved, virtual VNV, but also virtual ENV. Then you might start talking about, well, some of the tools that do more like you talked about. So maybe poetry, PDM, Hatch, Rye. But stuff people might not know about too much is Maturian or Ensconce or you know, there's a there's a wide ranging set of tools. And what you did really nicely in your article and talk is you said these five categories, let's create Venn diagrams and put into into the overlaps the various tools like PDM can do package publishing and building and environment management and package management, not Python version management. So that's kind of the way that you evaluated. That's the unbiased aspect right is that you're like okay let's just create some categories and and create some ways to evaluate you know how full featured or how good is this and then then you go through it right yeah there's actually one step further for the packaging tools like um hatch and pdm poetry and so on i also thought about features um and if you scroll down there's like a feature list um and things i thought about what should these tools be able to do or how do they differ? Um, for example, I, yeah, that's the one. So one is if it allows you to manage your dependencies and if it resolves and locks dependencies. Yeah. Since um, there are some tools like Hatch, which cannot do that at the moment. Um, I know that it's supposed to do it in the future, but if you want that functionality, then for example, you might not want to use Hatch at the moment. And then there's also, there's, a large number of PEPs on packaging, but I picked out two specific ones, one on editable installs, which I think can be quite useful, especially if you develop your package yourself and you want to oh, install yeah. it in editable mode. Um, yeah, maybe it's good to mention what this is. Since, yeah, yeah. Um, tell people why yeah. you care about that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you develop your project yourself and you want to make sure that during development, the changes to your package are directly reflected in your environment. You would install the package with pip install minus E for the editable flag and the name of the package. And then you do not have to reinstall it every time you make a change. Um, and yeah, this is very useful. And then there's one pep on how to specify your project metadata in the pyproject.toml file, which is like the basic file you need um, when you specify or create a package where you put all your like general information, the name of the package, the website, your author name and so on, but also the dependencies, you can define scripts there. Um, and there's one tool, namely Poetry, which has its own way of defining the metadata. I think because it was developed before this PEP was accepted Mm -hmm. And they also promised to change it at some point, but they still haven't done that. Um, so I guess that's also something at least you should be aware of when you choose a pool, tool like Poetry, that it might have a f yeah, like a few differences in how to specify it in the pyproject.toml file. Yeah, a lot. I'd like to hear your thoughts. I, to me, it seems like a lot of these tools like Poetry or Flit or others as their own thing, they're pretty self-contained and they kind of do do the job for most things you need to do for your package management, project management, you know, installing, um, hash doesn't lock, but as long as you kind of stick to them, you're, you're more or less, you can solve all the problems you need with one, but choosing and figure out how to choose which one is it, really hard and kind of like with your Rye example is the reason you chose one <laughs> You know, six months ago, might not there might be a better choice now. So it's it's good to see them side by side, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. And also, um, that's why I wanted to do the unbiased evaluation. Um, there's often personal preference that comes in with packaging tools. For example, um, one of my colleagues, like hates might be a strong word, but he <laughs> very strongly dislikes poetry since in the past they once did an update or a new version and the it broke something in the older versions, but they did not tell the users beforehand. And 
several people got very upset um, and they just said, okay, I'm not using poetry anymore. And yeah. um, now if you were then in a team with people and you choose a tool and one of them says like, no, we are not going to use poetry, then um, yeah, this is also has also an influence on people. So I think having an unbiased view of these tools can be very difficult since it's often also a team decision that if you're already used to using a tool, it might be easier to just use that in your team. Or if something is already right. working for you, then it might not be worth putting an effort to learn or yeah, get caught up with a new tool. Yeah, you don't have to necessarily keep switching to the newest, shiniest one of these, right? Like if it's working for you, whatever you're doing, it may be that's fine, right? Yeah. So before we get into this, many of these things we're going to talk about don't come with Python itself. Right, we have pip, we have venv, and set of tools, and I think that that's it out of this big long list of things. Do you have a a preference or a tendency to stick with what comes with Python so you don't have to install other things, or do you see the advantages of these external tools to be greater and worth it? I do see the use, and sometimes for me, although I've created so many virtual environments, I sometimes cannot remember how I need to call venv correctly to create a new virtual <laughs> environment. And mm -hmm. with virtual env, it's just virtual env and then the name of the environment, <laughs> and it's just simpler, and I can remember that. So sometimes it can be that easy that it makes it more useful, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes uh also, yeah. I was going to say other tools, uh, they're, they solve a, a different problem that's not really related. Like PipX and Pi E and V, there's no real Python equivalent no, to that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's go uh, through and I guess talk about probably one that people do less, but is also really important. Not package management, but Python management. You want to tell yes. us about, about that one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Python version management, I always included a short definition since um, there are no like proper definitions of these categories. It's just what I thought would be useful. So for me, Python version management means that the tool is able to install Python versions and lets you switch between them easily. And yeah, most popular for that is PyEnv. And it's also one of the few tools actually that can do that. You can also do Python version management with Conda and then this Rhino, which can do it and also PyFlow, but PyFlow is, I excluded it from my list since it's not actively developed anymore. It's still in the Venn diagram, but yeah, I'm not sure if it's um, that up to date anymore. But yeah, sure. you can just, um, with PyEnv, for example, you can say PyEnv install and then like 3.10.4 and we'll get the, um, the version of Python and install it on your system. And then you can just switch between the different versions you have installed. And yeah, this can be useful in many different ways. For example, if you have projects that support multiple Python versions, or maybe you just want to install the newest one and um, check out a few of the features it has to offer, uh, yeah, it can just be nice to be able to switch between the versions um, yourself or set them for your current shell session and so on. Yeah, and this starts to get us into an interesting, an interesting philosophy here. Many of these tools kind of take over your day-to-day -day flow of, of working with your code and the tools, right? So, for example, PyMV, you do... PyEnv local, PyEnv global, I guess maybe even more with things like Hatch and Flitch and Flit and so on is instead of just saying Python, my code or Python, you know, dash M some, something you would say like Flit run something, right? And yes, it, it sort of, you got to adopt, uh, you got to adopt its way of working on the terminal a little bit to get the most value out of it, right? Yes, and that's also something I found confusing in the beginning. I remember that when I used poetry for the first time, I didn't really understand why I couldn't run my 
package or my code anymore with Python, but I always had to put poetry run Python, my script dot pi. Yeah. Um, yeah. And once you understand that this enables the tool to run your code within a virtual environment for you with all the dependencies installed and you do not have to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, then it made click for me and it made sense. But in the beginning, I was thinking that it was just more complicated and yeah. I didn't really see the point. <laughs> yeah. And going back to the beginner type of thing, right? This is... It helps you in a lot of ways, but it's also a new thing that you have to learn in order to get started, right? Uh, it alleviates the need to say, well, now you know the V E and V command. You don't just run it. You say Python dash M and then you activate it and it's different on Windows. I don't know why it's different on Windows, but it just <laughs> is. So you just do that, you know, um, but at the same time, you now have to learn a slightly different way to run it. And so I think that that's a, an interesting trade off that a lot of these tools make. Um, Another thing that's that I think about when I think about these tools is like you were saying, you can't just run your Python code because a lot of times this management of the dependencies and the environment that often lives in some kind of hidden place in your user profile or somewhere, right? Whereas if I say Python dash MV and V, it makes a folder <laughs> wherever I run that. And so I can activate it. So, for example, if one of these tools were to make the environment locally instead of in some kind of you know obscure location it finds, then I could still just activate it and do regular Python things. But if it hides it from me, then I'm required basically for any practical reason to like go through its its terminal commands, its shell, its CLI, right? Yeah. But Is that you something can, you considered? Like, like which ones which ones have overrides to put them locally or do it by default? Or is that anything you considered here? No, actually I did not. But that's a very good point for an extension of the post <laughs> uh, to consider that. I just got used to just calling, for example, you with poetry, you can just say poetry shell and then it will activate the virtual environment for sure. you, right? So it's just I guess, getting used to a different way of activating your virtual environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that worked well for me, but I think it's just, yeah, it depends on how much you have used the other virtual environment um, functionalities before. For me, it wasn't that hard to switch, I guess, since I work yeah. a lot with packages and yeah, then it can be yeah. very convenient. I, I totally agree. I Guess what I didn't really say before when I was talking about like um, using the new CLI and stuff is when you're doing this for yourself, you kind of adopt one and you you get used to it and you're like, all right, this is great. But if I'm following, say, a tutorial on some docs, I, it'll say, you know, okay, activate the virtual environment this way. You're like, wait, that's not how I do it. <laughs> you know, now run Python. Wait, that's not how I run it. And so, yeah. you know, this this putting it together of like, I, I know what I'm doing and I see what the thing tells me to do, but how do you make sure that those are, are lining up? Um, and if there's a local environment that's kind of equivalent, like you could sort of follow the steps and it might still work. <laughs> it's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, that yeah, I think that's a very useful idea. I I will put that on my list of things to look at. Um, this could be your PyCon since... US talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I actually have an idea for PyCon US next year already, which um, I want to work on. I did a lot of packaging work um, for the last um, months, but I'm really, um, I really want to keep this post updated since I find it useful myself. And yeah. I was asked by so many people after the talks and also at my company now, um, many people ask me, which tool am I supposed to use now? And we have these requirements and so on. And running, like having the virtual environments um, somewhere where you can activate them also yourself, I think that's a very useful thing to do. I never thought about this following a tutorial um, point of view, but it is very important for learners, I guess. Yeah, so so, especially you. when you're a beginner. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's also worth pointing out there are some tools that you just didn't really evaluate because you didn't quite necessarily see that they fit totally in the picture, like PIP tools, which I'm a big fan of, actually. But um, also, Mike Fiedler out there asked, was Pi ENV dash virtual ENV <laughs> evaluated as well? No, it wasn't. I should write yeah. that down. 
I will yeah, do that I do. right now. Yeah, yeah, I don't even, I can guess, but I, I have no experience with Pi EMV, virtual EMV. But Me neither. The, the, the speaking of it is, is tricky. <laughs> okay. But I think I put PIP tools in the very end of the post into the categories of tools which yes. don't really fit in. Yeah. Also, Tox is there. Um, mm -hmm. And the author of Tox, which can be used or which I only knew for, from testing, where it allows you um, during testing to specify different Python versions which you want to run your tests with. But Tox also can be used to handle virtual environments. And I was completely unaware of that. But um, still, yeah, so it's still not complete the picture with the five categories, <laughs> but it's already complicated enough, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if it, how much value it adds to like really say, oh, we're going to completely cover everything because part of the value is, is making a few recommendations as well, I think. Like, yes not just going here's a complete list because that sounds more like an awesome list of packaging which maybe that exists i don't know and maybe that's also a good um point to add for everyone that wants the like the solution now um i do not have the solution i cannot like give you the best tool it really depends on what you want to do what your team is doing what your personal preferences are um hopefully at some point we might have the one tool which can do everything and is adopted by most people. But at the moment, lots of these tools are really used and um, also can be useful. Yeah. There's, there's so many variations. There's more variations, not fewer. So I, I, I would like to see that too, but it's, it, it is tricky. And there's so many, I think another one of the challenges to think about that I know I've seen previously around say for example pip env versus some of the other tools where are are you building a library that you want others to use or are you building an application yes. right because if you over constrain say like your lock file no one can use your library but that's exactly what you want for your application so it's totally stable right these kinds of tensions are in there and so it could also be pick the right tool for the right situation Absolutely. I actually, um, in the beginning, when I first worked on the talk, like it is 45 minutes long, which is the longest time slot you can get at PyCon. Um, and I had this diff, like, or this point with applications versus library in it, but I really had to get rid of stuff since it was way too long. Um, and it was really hard to decide what to talk about and what not, since there are so many points to consider that it can be hard to boil it down to the most important facts. Yeah. All right, let's talk I also about... Had, yeah. Oh, good, sorry. No, um, I just was thinking that I also had live demos in the talk in the beginning for the different mm -hmm. tools, but all, that yeah. also took up way too much time. But it <laughs> can be fun to play around with them to yeah, get to know them better. It's super fun. The live demos that involve downloading stuff from the internet are scary, though, because at conferences, the, the internet can be pretty sketchy sometimes. Yeah, that's true. All right, so the first area was virtual environment management, and that's tools like VENV, also virtual ENV, PIP ENV, which we just talked about, Conda, uh, uh, and then even Raya. So let's maybe talk about uh, some of these. You sort of compare... Um, we, we talked a bit about using VENV versus virtual EMV. I've always just stuck with the built-in one for the reason that it's built in, but you know, mm -hmm. it sounds like you use virtual EMV more. What's your, what do you find better use about both, it? both actually. You, sometimes yeah. I use one and sometimes the other. Yeah. I, I actually don't really know why. <laughs> uh, my understanding is virtual so, EMV yeah. is faster, but I don't know. It's, it's not something I'm doing a ton of, so it's like I'll set one up for a project and then I'm good to go. So I don't, it doesn't really motivate me. Uh, one area that I think is important to cover is maybe the files that specify your project and your dependencies and dependency yes, restrictions. Yes, maybe let's do that. Yeah, yeah. So traditionally, there's been this requirements.txt, which is just lines in a text file. But there's been a in almost all of these tools a move towards pyproject.toml. 
Exactly. So um, I think that's a very important point to know about if you talk about packaging in general, um, that you have one file, which is pyproject.toml. Um, for me, toml was in the beginning of a new config language or format I didn't know about. So it's like you have YAML files and JSON files and toml is this other format, which is quite simple. And it was decided to um, use the toml format. And in the PEP for pyproject.toml, where it was introduced, they also discussed the different formats. So it's quite an interesting read. And yeah, this is the central file in your package. I already mentioned that you put like general information there, like the name of the package, um, the author names, where the readme is and so on. But it allows you to do very complex things as well. Now you can configure tools there. Like if yeah. you want to do formatting with black or style checks and so on, you can define that there. Yeah. And um, you can put your dependencies when what you uh, mentioned there, then some tools allow you even to specify different virtual environments and how they should look like. You can define scripts that you want to run. And then, for example, if you always run your PyTest tests, um, you can have like a command hatch run test or poetry run test and it would run the test for you and maybe also do the coverage report and so on. Yeah, in your article, you link over to the pandas pyproject.toml, and that thing has a lot, a lot of stuff going on, as you would imagine from such a project as pandas, right? But you can even specify like project URLs, uh, entry points for just running a, a command uh, on the terminal. Um, things like if you want to use AWS, you could pip install bracket AWS, and it'll that actually brings in a whole list of potential dependencies or GCP. And yeah, pretty, pretty comprehensive. Way more than and just also, the list of dependencies. You know, if you um, stay there, that is also an important point that in the PyProject Toml file, you define which build backend you use. So yeah. um, this would then be where you, for example, maybe have poetry or hatchling or set up tools and, and so on. So mm -hmm. which tool you want to use to really do the building step in the, like behind the curtain? How do you say yeah. that? Yeah, yeah you yeah, know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, yeah, here's the the build system that it's got here. Uh, what do, build back in is MesonPy for this particular one. Interesting. Yeah, so this is... It's less important if you have a pure Python thing, right? Although it's still potentially relevant for building the wheel. But if you've got a really complex, like a Rust integration or a C++ integration, then how that all happens when you say build, you want to have a lot of control over that, right? And also, if you use a tool like Poetry, it will set the build backend to Poetry, I guess, automatically. Mm -hmm. um, which most of the tools do. Most of the tools decide which build backend to use. Only PDM is a tool which allows the user to choose the build backends freely. I think Hatch uses Hatchling. Um, Poetry uses Poetry, yep. I guess. Um, I don't know about the others, actually. <laughs> sure. Okay. We've been talking for a little while. Now we finally come to the thing the person wants to do. Pip install a package, <laughs> right? Exactly. So that is package management. Mm -hmm. So um, there are several tools that allow you to download and install libraries and their dependencies. And the major one, which everyone knows, I guess, is pip. But there's also pipx, or you could use conda to install packages, but also poetry, for example, like one of these packaging tools. Um, and yeah, it will download the library for you and install all the dependencies automatically. Um, yeah, I guess that's the most important thing to know about it. Yeah, so a lot of these will make the virtual environment for you. And then you just, instead of pip install, you their name install, right? Like poetry install. Or sometimes they have add, right? Something along those lines. But then they'll figure out where their virtual environment is and install the thing the way you've asked. Yes. And other... also, if you use one of the packaging tools, it will do the dependency 
um, resolutions for you, which sometimes works, sometimes not so well. But um, I guess this is something that Pip is not doing. I think it just tells you about conflict. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another important thing that it helps you, that many of these tools help you with that Pip will not help you with is dependency recording or accounting, I guess is the right way to maybe think about that, as well as restricting it to a particular version. So if you add one of these things, it might put the dependency into the pyproject.toml and then also create a lock file, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, should we shortly say what lock files are about? Yeah, yeah, tell people about it. Yeah, okay, so this is the second recap I had in the talk or which is also in the blog post. First one was pyproject.toml and the second one is a lock file. Um, since So in the pyproject.toml file, you would usually have your dependencies, but in an abstract fashion. So you would not pin them to exact versions. So you would not say, I need pandas 2.0.3, but you would set a range or not give a restriction at all. And then you have the log file, which really records the exact versions of all the dependencies that you have installed for a project. And if you commit or have that log file within your repository, it allows um, to really reproduce the exactly same setup that you have on your machine. So you can yeah, reproduce it on multiple platforms. And I also linked one, I think the one from Poetry. So if you look at a log file, it can become huge since it really has the exact versions of all dependencies and subdependencies and so on recorded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. here we go. This one from Poetry. Yeah, that is, uh, let's see, that's 1,685 lines. That is, um, that's a big lock file. Yes, it is. It also, though, it does uh, follow some of the best practices, right? So it says... Um, the package mypy in the version of it, rather than just mypy equal equal one five one, it'll have things like, and here's the hash of that, which is, you know, a recommendation to store that. Uh, but in addition to just saying, here's the hash it, for my particular install, it has it, here it is for Mac OS, here it is for this other version of that, here it is for Linux, here it is for the ARM version of Windows or the AMD version of Windows, right? Uh, and on and on. Uh, so it, it does record a lot of information there, but the main goal of just saying in a year, if I go pip install or poetry um, update or what, I don't remember the poetry command. There's so many, I've been read all of the different CLIs for all of them. So the equivalent of pip install, it'll, it'll look at that and go exactly the same thing because I see uh, one of the guys in the audience here, I was just speaking with him one of my courses i i didn't pin the dependencies and it uses sql alchemy and sql alchemy 2 is now out which is awesome but sql alchemy 2 has a breaking change from sql alchemy 1 so some code sample wouldn't run it's like oh what's going on I'm like oh no just for now pin, pin the dependency yourself and I'll, I'll fix it later today but it's it's not a theoretical problem i, I like literally ran into it yesterday today uh, through by way of one of the students yeah, I agree. It can be very useful. Also, if you work on a project with several people, then um, having the same setup everywhere can, yeah, um, keep you from having a headache. Yeah. How much isolation do you do just personally for your work? Do you do like Docker containers or is it enough to just have a, a lock file and agreed upon version of Python? And we often use Docker containers since I work a lot with production um environments but for personal projects i usually only use the log file yeah same here i don't really use docker all that much it's i find that it's it's enough with just a lock file all right yeah log, log file is super important um maybe that you know instead of going through all all of these maybe just give a your thoughts on on some of the with regard to package management just some of the yeah. things in here yeah, I think um, for me, especially one important point was um, there is Conda also, which you can use for lots of things, but the post and also the talk does not go into detail on Conda since it's this huge, um, like, 
huge own environment or universe yeah. with Conda. Also, packaging works a little differently, and the resulting packages will be on the not on PyPI, but they have their own index. So um, yeah, there is not a lot of detail there, and there's also pipenv. I've never used pipenv myself actually. Mm -hmm. I never really had the use case for it, but it had has been around for a long time. Um, and what I found interesting is that pipenv uses also the log, log file functionality and also introduces a toml file, but it's pipfile.toml, um, mm -hmm. um, which I found interesting since it shows that also some tools before the standard was introduced used something similar, which... Um, I found interesting, but for me now, I'm not using pipenv since I like having only the PyProject TOML file. Having this additional pip file just confuses me. Um, yeah, because a lot of the packaging and stuff you can already do through PyProject.toml, so why have more exactly. files? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I often also have to do package building, so to get a wheel file um, or... Yeah, just be able to install the packages on different environments and then it's nice to use one of the other tools since pipenv can do package management and, and environment management but not the packaging itself like building a wheel file or um, publishing the package do, which one skipping ahead a little bit um what one are you using these days for building packages or publishing them um, I'm currently using Hatch. Um, I like it a lot since it allows you to declare your environments within the PyProject TOML file. And I like to have everything organized. So having a single place where you can also say, okay, this is my environment for creating the documentation. And um, I only need material um, like MKDocs material um, for this. Um, or having one environment for all the style issues like running black and I sort and the type checkers. Um, I, I like that a lot. Um, but a lot of people from my company are now using Rye. So I have to check that out, I guess, very soon <laughs> for some proper project. Yeah, I want to save Rye until the end because it's a, it's a very different philosophy not putting a judgment on it, but just it really lives in a different uh, s style and philosophy than many of these other tools. So absolutely, I think yeah. you hinted towards this with the packaging panel discussion I had with some folks there. And it's, I think we're going to see stuff going that way. Maybe not exactly with Rye, but in, in that general, general vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this idea of having multiple environments for certain s different, parts of your program or of your project is really interesting because for small projects, it doesn't matter, right? But as they get bigger and bigger, I, I was just talking to Brian Aachen yesterday on Python Bytes about this, and he'd brought this up. On Talk Python training, I have maybe, the, where, where the courses are, I have maybe 48 dependencies that I list in the main top level. These are the things I'm using, but there's 250 different packages if you pip install dash r you know to like build out that whole thing right the transitive dependencies most of the time it will not install everything right i can get the stuff to run the site all the time but also the data science analysis stuff and the notebook tools and other things like this mk doc stuff one of those has a restriction that is something some you know something less than x and another part has something greater than x and they just they can't go together and they don't necessarily need to live together but in order just without having a separation of the where the dev tools go and where the accounting tools go and the, where the runtime tools go they get too mixed together you know yeah absolutely um i'm also actually not sure if any of the other tools do the same already since um, it all changes so quickly. I haven't checked the other tools in the past four weeks. So um, I just got started with Hatch. And that's also what I mentioned in the beginning. Sometimes when you got used to using a tool and it works well for you, you do not get weird errors when you install it or do things. And you find when you have a problem, you find the error messages useful and how it works. And I also like the podcast epi episode you um had with the author. Um, it was very... Yeah, with the effect. 
Yeah. Yes, thanks. exactly. Um, yeah, I really liked listening to it and that he's working on it. And I find it really impressive what he's doing with just, is he not, he's not even able to type, right? I'm, I Was he able to believe type? he has I some limit. I believe he can. I think it's yes. just uh, yeah. limited. So yeah, it's, it's really impressive what he's doing. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, I think it's great. I think Hatch is cool. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But um, I have to say, I also used poetry in the past, um, which also worked well for me. I have cool. nothing against poetry. <laughs> <laughs> just your teammate does. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Let's see. We talked about Conda. Um, let's, don't want to just make it a, a go into all the lists. So let me let me come down here and find uh, some more. Maybe I think PDMs may be interesting. Uh, it's yes. it's one of the newer ones, so people might know less about it. Do you want to talk, tell people about PDM? Yes. Um, yeah. It's also I sometimes forget about it since I have never used it, but I know several people which like it a lot. Um, so PDM for me was quite new since um, most of the tools are based on using virtual environment environments and PDM is one of the only tools I think that implements a PEP which is PEP 582 on local packages which is an alternative yeah. way of implementing environment management and the PEP was recently rejected so um, yeah beforehand it was open of um, whether that might be the new way to do um, environment management but I think it's still an interesting approach and um, yeah, PDM is also, I guess, used by many people. It can do everything except for managing Python versions. Um, but uh, to choose your build backend freely, so you have quite a lot of flexibility. And um, it's also developed very um, quickly. So it, like new features are added and um, it's in mm -hmm. ver a very active project. Earlier... Um, Mike Fiedler said, pour one out for easy install. Indeed. I would say, I would add to that, that, you know, pour one out for poor PEP 582, because I really like that idea. You know, it's, it was a little bit like the, the way that node modules and the project.json stuff works for node, where it's just like, if you try to do something, it's just going to go up in the directories until it finds the directory that contains the thing, you know, like find where the virtual environment is at the top and just use that without you have to activate it and do all sorts of stuff. And I thought that was a cool idea, um, but it's it's not a thing, unfortunately. So I guess yeah. it's still a thing for PDM, right? Yes, it is. Um, I also, I didn't read about the rejection, so I have no idea why it was rejected, but I know that they always put a lot of thought on or into the um, rejection. So why they... yeah do that i have to check that out you know you look at other ecosystems other programming languages they've got like five ways to do one thing and they're just it it seems like it's just constantly being changed to just chase trends and if over the years that becomes a real messy language and way to do things so i really appreciate that that python says no often but i i will miss this feature you know yeah I think it's also impressive how much work is put into these PEPs, um, how much work they do on like formulating their ideas and discussing it very thoroughly to get to a good result. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely. very happy that they do that for Python. <laughs> Me too. And the, I think another really interesting aspect is just so many people use it, right? There's so many edge cases or scenarios that don't necessarily, maybe this breaks that I, I don't know about. Let me pose a question from the audience here from Demystifying Dev says, newbie question, if pip freeze outputs a perfectly usable requirements.txt file, if you want, can't that be used? What's lacking? Why are these other tools? I think, honestly, the reason I bring this up is this kind of like, is it almost like, why do all these tools exist, right? It really is at the heart of your whole article or talk. Um, yeah, I think, um, especially now, this is, just one of the use cases, right? Many of the tools do lots of other things as well. I think that's why a lot of them exist, especially on packaging, such that you do not have to use a one tool or several tools for all the different steps. Um, 
in this. Sorry, I cannot see the questions any question anymore. Um, so I guess I still know people which use uh, requirements.txt files. So I do think it can be useful, especially if you do not work with packaging. So if you don't want to create a package and um, pyproject.toml puts or adds another level of complexity, which you don't use, then I don't think you have to use it. Um, I guess that's really specific for your use case. But if you have a yeah. package and you have all this other information that you need to um, yeah, publish with it, then it's nice to have this one single file with everything, also with the dependencies and not have many different files for different things. Yeah, I agree. I think another aspect of this is this totally works well, but a lot of it's manual, right? So I could pip install a thing and it works, but then if I forget to go and put it into the requirements.txt, well, that was a manual step that I needed to remember. Or I put it in there, but I forgot to pin it. <laughs> you run into the problem that I ran into uh, earlier, right? With SQL Alchemy changing. And with the other tools, they just, that's their flow, right? You say um, poetry add whatever, it puts it into the, the requirements file, it puts it into the lock file, right? It, it installs it. All of those things are kind of taken care of you for you. So I think part of it is that they, uh, the tools kind of do the recommended workflow for you rather than you having to remember to do it. Yeah, that's a very good point. And yeah, it's thanks. also allows you to make less mistakes with your project. Yeah, you don't even have to really be aware of that. As a newbie, you just say, well, I know I say hatch add a thing and then it works, right? It, I don't have to know, well, here's why you use the hash and here's why you pin the dependency. It just it just does. Um, you do give a mention to pip tools here at the end. Somewhere there. Um, and I think if you go the requirements.txt file way, which actually, honestly, the thing I'm using these days is pip tools. Uh, it lets you create a file and then it creates this requirement, like, kind of like pip freeze, it creates this requirements.txt, but it also lets you evolve that over time. Like you can say, I want to upgrade my thing. So if I'm using fast API and I say, pip install dash dash upgrade fast API, it'll upgrade fast API, but not the things like Starlet that Fast API uses, right? And that's another reason to not do um, that more manual process that we were just talking about. Because it, how do you make sure you update all of the things in a coherent way, right? That's very, very tricky. So um, you can still do it, but you I, even if you do that, I think you got to use something like Pip Tools or some other higher order, higher order thing there. Yeah, I can yeah. also understand that it's sometimes. It can be frustrating in the beginning if you have to look into another tool to do what you want to do if there's this simple hacky way to do it. But if you think in the long run and also if you work on bigger projects, it's always a good idea to get used to these tools in the beginning since they save you a lot of work and also save you from doing mistakes that you then have to debug, which is annoying. Also, you know, when you're working by yourself, you know, YOLO, you get to do whatever you want. But like you working in a team, using something like Hatch means everybody does the same thing. And that's actually really important too. Yeah. Actually, um, I think Rai uses pip tools as well. Oh, interesting. Okay, I let's let's close out our, our conversation here with Rai because it's it's different in the way that it, it's philosophy on how it's, it works for package management, right? Yes. So um, I think if you want to understand Rai, you have to know about Rust, um, which is a very popular programming language at the moment. And Rust has a very nice setup of how packaging works, since you have um, two tools, namely RustUp and Cargo, which do everything. You do not have these um, different tools for different steps, and everyone can uh, like contribute their own tool and gets really messy and um, hard to understand as it is for Python, but um, it is very simple and easy to use. And um, the author of Rai um, wrote Rai completely in Rust and was inspired by 
Rust up in cargo. And Rye is also a tool that can do everything. It also does, um, is doing Python version management for you, which I guess is easier since it is not written in Python. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a tool that can do it all. It was started as a personal project, but there are new versions released, I guess, weekly. Um, like when I last checked it, it was moving really, really fast. And the author is also the creator of Flask. So um, he's, I guess, very well known. It's, that's also why people are adopting Rye very quickly. Um, yeah, so I think it's a very nice or interesting addition to the whole mix. Yeah, I think it is as well. And the most unusual thing, the reason I said it's unlike all of the others, the way that I use pipx is I somehow say Python, or I say somehow pip install pipx, and then I can use pipx. Or I somehow Python dash m pip install hatch, and then I can use hatch for more Python stuff. But all of those things start with Python some version of Python, and then I can do more Python things with them. Whereas Rust up in, in that world and Rye in the, the Python world, it says you have nothing. You don't even have Python. You ask for a version of Python and then you ask for environments, then you ask for dependencies. And so it, it has all the flexibility. It wants to do whatever it needs because it doesn't actually depend on you even having Python, much less the right version of Python, yeah? Exactly. You think that's going to be a trend? Do you think we're headed that way? Wow, that's hard to answer. I'm actually not sure. Um, I, I think it would be nice. I would really like having a tool that can do everything and get rid of this clutter. Um, also, since I like everything to be organized and it can be really confusing. And um, yeah. I know that most people are just complaining about packaging in Python. So, um, yeah, but I know that also um, it's just difficult to get to the state where you have this one tool. I remember that discussion from your podcast with the packaging panel. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not that people do not want to have this tool. This, like there are reasons that it's so hard to, to do it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to get everybody to agree, switch over to this thing. Um, whereas I think Rust was more built from scratch or designed from scratch to have it. And that's an advantage Rust has existing, you know, getting created when it did more recently. Like Python came out when we had Usenet maybe, right? Like certainly the ubiquity of the internet wasn't there and we just didn't downloading stuff off the internet everywhere just on your command prompt or whatever it was at the time. It's just not a thing. So yeah. It's and it's good that newer languages learn from the mistakes of previous ones. So yeah, it's good I, that they I, edit it. We probably will end up with something like Rye, but uh, that maybe people got to agree on it and that's tough. I guess um, one really quick thing to close out this whole section, the uh, main topic is Tony out in the audience asks, I'm working on a large Python mono repo. So we have all kinds of dependency conflicts and resolutions we have to deal with. I, Maybe just worth like pointing out that the multiple environments that Hatch has might address that. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, like I'm also in my project right now. We have a huge mono repo, but the different folders also correspond often to different packages. So they have their own PyProject.toml file. So you can keep the dependencies like organized. Um, but if you have lots of dependencies that are for specific things um, and they are not necessarily related um, to what you're doing in a different step, then that can be very useful. The hatch functionality where you can define virtual environments with only the dependencies that you need for the specific task, like creating the documentation or yeah, checking style things. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, you can see there are many more tabs on my web browser of things I would like to bring up and chat with you about on this topic. But at the same time, we are out of time and it's getting late over there in Germany. So maybe we'll, we'll call it, uh, uh, 
call it a wrap here. But before we get out of here, um, how about a, a recommendation for um, a Python package or project that you think is cool? Yes. So um, I thought about this since there are lots of people who always um, suggest so many nice packages. But what I'm really using a lot is um, MKDocs material for building documentation without a lot of work. Um, I've just did that today. Um, since especially nice. if you work on a project with like, which is difficult to explain to other people and you want to have one place and not use Confluence or other tools for um, documentation, this is a very nice tool to use. Excellent. Yeah, it looks great. And more than a static site, it says, sets up search and all kinds of cool things for it. And it's very easy to use. I think even for beginners, that is a very easy way to set up a nice documentation for your package, which you can build now with one of the tools we discussed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is. Okay. Excellent presentation. I really like the way you put this all together. It's going to be super helpful for folks. So yeah, final call to action. I feel like people. It. Yeah, thanks. Final call to action. People are interested in this. They want to learn more. Maybe they should check out your article, which we'll link to. Uh, the two conference talks that you gave. What else do you tell them? Um, yeah, I think actually that's the best way to go. The other projects that we discussed on previous podcasts are also on my blog. Um, and mm -hmm. definitely check out my GitHub profile, I think. Um, I have, for example, a repository on machine learning with machine learning tutorials, which is really popular. So if you like machine learning, that might be useful as well. We mm -hmm. can link um, the GitHub repo, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put it in the show notes. And Elena, thank you for being here. It's always nice to have you on the show. Thank you.